and welcome. My name is Brendan Donahue. I'm the Project Technology Manager here at CJCA, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, this webinar is a series of presentations held by the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, and if you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can always find the links to view those archived on uh, their website for more information, as we will be doing for this webinar here today. Uh, before I hand the presentation to today's moderator, I want to quickly point out some functions of today's uh, webinar. You have the option to listen today through either your computer speakers or by the telephone. But what's important here is that you choose whichever option uh, you're going to be using on your computer screen. So if you cho chose to dial in on your telephone, make sure that you've chosen the use telephone option on your computer screen. This will really help ensure that you've got the best audio, audio quality and reduce any unwanted feedback. If you're experiencing any echo with your audio, just make sure that the uh, selection on your screen matches what you're listening to. Uh, because we've got a large number of people registered for today's webinar, there's actually 389 registered uh, participants today, we're going to have all of our participants be on mute. But you can ask questions to our panelists anytime by typing those questions in here on the webinar control panel. It should be towards the bottom of your control panel. We're going to take time for questions at the end of the presentation, but please do not feel like you have to hold your questions to the end. Type them in here and we'll try and address as many, as many of those questions as we can uh, throughout the course of the presentation. Again, today's webinar will be recorded. The presentation slides will also be made available and it's generally sent in follow-up emails within 48 hours of the webinar ending. Uh, so if you don't see anything right away, don't sweat. We will be sending out follow-up emails with links to the presentation and the video recording. So hopefully I've covered everything to get us started. I'm going to turn things over to today's moderator, sitting across from me, Ned Logren, Executive Director of CJCA. Ned? Uh, thank you very much, Brendan, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, CJCA Resource Network webinar, Measuring Positive Youth Outcomes. As Brendan said, my name is Ned Logren. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, better known as CJCA. Uh, the CJCA Re Resource Network is supported by a grant from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. The CJCA Resource Network serves as an online center for information, activities, and communications. And today's webinar is the last in a series of webinars that the Resource Network has sponsored. We've had them on screening and assessment, mental health, dual status youth, uh, the PACT program in Pennsylvania, which is an Earn to Learn program. And today, uh, saving the best for last, we have the performance-based standards on measuring positive youth outcomes. So the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce you to, to the work both CJCA and the per Performance-Based Standards Learning Institute has been doing to shift the focus of the juvenile justice system away from deficit-based and punishment-oriented strategies to practices that promote youth's strengths and healthy adolescent development. Research continues to support positive youth development frameworks, strategies, and interventions to help youth make successful transitions to adulthood and to also hold them accountable for wrongdoing. Progressive agencies and leaders are implementing positive youth development philosophies, policies, and practices. The new way of thinking about juvenile justice youth as developing adolescents has sparked demands for measures other than recidivism to reflect progress youth make while they're in custody that are timely, meaningful, and reflective of services provided. Our first presenter this afternoon is Kim Godfrey, the Executive Director of the PBS Learning Institute. Kim will talk about the development and purpose of the PBS Positive Outcomes Report and following Kim, Shannon Myrick, Strategic Initiatives Manager for the Oregon Youth Authority, will present on OYA's training of staff in positive youth development. And so I'm pleased to introduce Kim to begin our webinar. Thanks, Ned, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Shannon, for joining us all the way from Oregon. Um, what we're going to talk about in this webinar is some of the reasons why it's so important to look at positive youth outcome measures the history of how we got to where we are right now, what Ned was referring to is our positive youth outcomes report, and then I am really looking forward to hearing Shannon talk about the Oregon Youth Authority, or OIA, training, which I have not been able to attend myself, but I've heard is really phenomenal. 
So quickly, who we are. Um, CJCA is a national organization of all the state agency directors. And performance-based standards is a national program implementing the data-driven PBS improvement model. Um, the quick link between our agencies was PBS was developed by CJCA 20 years ago, um, thanks to a grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. When the federal funding ended in 2004, we created a separate entity that is dedicated to really and exclusively expanding PBS as an improvement model that always challenges agencies and facilities to provide the highest quality operations program services and provide training, technical assistance, coaching, and resources. We spent a lot of the last 10 years in particular expanding what we know about conditions of confinement and quality of life and facilities to align with the research, especially around adolescent development and positive youth development. Um, now, we're not the PYD or the PYO gurus or anything like that. But I'm going to tell you the story about how we got to where we are measuring positive youth outcomes with the hopes and actually the belief that I'm sure you can find a little nugget or two in what we did to get this going where you are. So in the beginning, this all started with this magic R word called recidivism. And the public and lawmakers increasingly demand that they have some sort of measure of what they are getting for this investment. This very, as you all know, they will call the very most expensive investment in the defense of the juvenile justice system. Um, there are many problems with recidivism from the beginning. It, of course, came from adult correction. And it was a measure of failure. And it really wasn't meaningful to what was going on in terms of time and scope in the juvenile justice facility. So national leaders started talking and, and realizing they really needed to get a broader picture of what recidivism looks like and, and get a sense of how they could really explain to the public and to the lawmakers how they were taking care of kids and what was happening once a youth was removed from his or her family or community. And among his other many problems was, of course, was, well, the question of, so how do we compare? How is your recidivism rate compared to your next door neighbor? And we can all over time, I remember how we were all being compared to Massachusetts or being compared to Missouri. But the fact was the comparison was really lacked any meaning or grounding. There was and is no nationally mandated standardized definition of what event creates a recidivist, what population you need to measure, or really for how long. So the conversation went from that to, all right, what are we really talking about? And CJCA began to look and talk from state to state. Are we talking about kids who are returning to court? Are we talking about kids who just got arrested again? Are we talking about kids who you know, just messed up on parole? Or are we talking about kids who are sent back into the system? So you can see how the national dialogue grew, and there was this growing need to get a handle on this measure of what was being done in the juvenile justice system, and really what was the impact of what we were doing on kids. So CJCA created a recidivism committee, and their charge is really to get a grip on this sort of national discussion and constant requirement for recidivism, which of course I, I don't, and I don't believe anyone thinks is ever going to go away, but it needs to become something meaningful, measurable, and useful. But you'll see all along, and this is, I think, going back about 10 years ago, it has always been just as important to know what is an indicator of a kid's success as it is to know whether or not the kid failed. So back when CJCA was starting its work on recidivism, it also started to identify sort of other outcomes. And they focused on two areas. One, all the positive youth development research, which is really looking at some of the activities that research or practical experience and you know our, our best evidence shows would impact on recidivism, as well as minis, minimize the disruption um, to a kid's normal maturation process when he or she is incarcerated. And then also this idea of looking at interim outcomes, something that would show the practices on the ground, attention where staff and kids are, and something that can um, be influenced by what the staff are doing, professionals are doing, 
and show some sort of progress, kids are moving towards something, not necessarily this long-term be-all, end-all measure of does the kid grow up to be a law-abiding citizen, but in fact, can he or she make some progress while they are in the system? So the CJCA national organization right away put stood things on its head and started looking at positive youth outcomes. They created a committee and they've been doing a very thorough job of looking at the literature and again surveying state agencies and research staff to get an understanding of what, what is out there already, what's available. Um, positive youth measures, outcomes are not necessarily easily available or easy to access. So first they started getting some grounding in what is going. And then they reached out to PBS because we are just um, a gold mine of interim outcomes, I guess you could say. A quick little PBS 101 is we collect a lot of information from participants across the country, the data collection cycle. Then we give it right back to them so they can take a look at it and analyze it and use it literally a weekend after they've entered it on the website. And then they use it to create improvements and continually monitor and measure what's going on. Um, CJCA, and they all know we are a wealth of both quantitative data and qualitative data. It's a really neat mix of what you can find in an incident report or a youth record as well as perceptions of kids staff and family. It's not a pass-fail one-time judgment system, but this sort of continual looking at data. And then of course we put it in these nice, easy to read bar graph reports that let people look at how they did six months ago, how they do compared to the average of all their other like facilities, and as well as some other ways to slice and dice the data. So bringing the two, oh, and, and here's a few things, for example, that um, we know are, we're already a poor, we were already reporting um, when this all got started. So perception of fairness. I think the pathway study made that most clear that um, fairness is really one of the most important things for kids, not only their behavior while they're incarcerated, but in the community. And it also popped up the genuine commitment to fairness as one of the guiding principles of the developmental approaches suggested by the National Academy of Sciences report. So the, infer the purpose of this kind of data is really to inform. Um, we know if the perceptions are positive, it's going to help the culture and long-term success. But it's really also important just to see um, maybe we need to do something differently. Maybe we need to take an approach. Maybe we need to implement a new training like Shannon will talk about later. And then we want to know, well, how did it go? What is the impact? And then another one easily available is kids' perception of safety. You know, providing these interim measures is, is to sort of help paint a picture of what facilities do with or for kids when they don't always have control of them over a weekend. So isolation is not, excuse me, recidivism is not an isolated, isolated event. So it's, it's really looking here now these interim measures of what goes on in facilities. Okay, so with all that background, we decided to undertake, and also with some real specific help and direction from the Oregon Youth Authority, and um, more recently with the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, to come up with a project that looks at all this existing data that indicates how well we're implementing some of the research-based practices that are under the auspices of positive youth development and part of the way we can help show kids progress toward um, leaving and succeeding when they get back to the community. And we looked at the research out there in addition to working with our partners in Oregon, Massachusetts, and the Council of Juvenile Correctional Ministers. We of course looked at the positive youth development framework and some of the tenets there of making sure we were looking at success, not failure, and the idea of these short-term or interim gains and with the overall belief we are really helping kids along their normal maturation process so they will be <coughs> successful. And then we looked at the um, publications by the National Academy of Sciences and some of their guiding principles 
And since the Reforming Juvenile Justice first document came out, even mentioned PBS because we had been a government program, um, we, we, I guess you could say we're a little <laughs> well, flattered and awfully interested to see it. But also we realized we were in a, a unique position and really ought to be taking um, advantage of the work we've done to help move this discussion forward and really implement the developmental process. So with all this swirling around and a lot of hardworking um, individuals trying to kind of get this to the next step, with, but really with so much out there, there, there wasn't necessarily um, a single path needed to go. We, we started, we tried to map <coughs> all these existing domains from the research models, from what the CJCA committee had been working on in their survey, and then Oregon Youth Authority, and <coughs> Shannon will um, share with you this incredible approach they have that's even bigger than positive youth development. Um, but they have an incredible matrix also that looks at domains and data and all of how do you line it to make sure the kids are getting the best of services and of course moving towards successful release. So we're swirling around with all this information and we came up with, well, there are five domains we feel sort of pulls it together in a way that fits in with PBS's mission and PBS's work within residential correction, detention, assessment, and community-based programs. We started looking among our data for things that show healthy and supportive staff-kid relationships, safety, kids' safety, behavioral, emotional, physical, um, of course, the education and vocational engagement, their connection to community and family, and the planning for the future. So they're sort of a hybrid of domains. And again, our charge was to look at what we already have and already are collecting, so we didn't make any more work, and really to kind of mine what was already available and put it into this framework. So this is sort of, this is an example, it's kind of messy, but we did a lot of mapping. We asked a lot of questions of kids, of staff, of families, and look at, as I said earlier, both quantitative and qualitative data. So we tried to map some of our data elements with these domains. And the process was even messier to share you a little bit of our dirty laundry. We would go through and list all the questions, um, for example, on some of our surveys that we thought would indicate um, some sort of progress along um, in better education or vocational engagement. And we even kind of highlighted and, and picked. And we came up with, thanks to a lot of our partners, uh, 22 outcomes that we are now happily calling the PBS positive Youth Outcomes Report. And what they really are are more flags or triggers. There are three health outcomes, and I'll share some of the data with you in a minute. <coughs> um, um, almost um, 10 programming outcomes about their education, their treatment planning, um, volunteers, their level and phase system, and the contact with aftercare and community case managers. And then, of course, a lot of the family outcomes that are part of PDF. So the idea behind creating this report was, was many, actually. It was to put this at the forefront of participants' mind and the field's mind that we need to think about things in terms of positive youth outcomes and interim measures of how we're helping kids just mature so they can be successful when they leave. Um, and, and also to help start connect the dots between research, practice, and measurement. And the way we do that really best, I think, in PBS is we just revamped um, what we call our PBS blueprint. And here's a quick snapshot of one of the areas uh, in positive youth development. Um, the blueprint links our outcome measures with all the other data. So this is talking about preparedness. So you'll see it will say, well, here's the outcome measures, like the outcome measures in our positive youth outcomes report. But if you want to dig a little deeper, here's supporting data, here's some of the things staff say that's related. Here's some of the things you can look at in a kid's record, and here are some of the um, um, perceptions or survey responses from a youth exit interview. And the idea behind this, and here's sort of another section that has the same sort of um, connection of the dots, and we also talk about policies and practice. 
The idea is that this outcomes report, it, again, is sort of your trigger. If, for example, um, you are not having a whole lot of kids leave at, the higher, at a higher level of wound relief, or they are not getting visits from their parents, parents, or the, the contact is not what you want it to be, you go digging deeper into something like this and look at what else and what practices you might be able to change and where, um, where can you have an impact or, or, or make a change. So it's really a way to dive deeper. But the idea for us was let's first grab hold of what's already there, what's tangible, what people understand, some 22 you know, sort of basic measures of those larger domains, and then see what happens. So because we've been doing this performance-based standards for so many years, this is a quick map. The blues um, are the 33 states who we're working with currently. There are about 200 facilities across the country. Um, I can share with you some of what we have been looking at in terms of outcome measures that show <clears throat> the impact of some positive youth development activities. Um, we look, of course, at kids who improve in their reading and math scores. And we just had our 20th anniversary, so we've been doing a little bit of reflective looking. So this shows that over in the past 10 years, the math scores, and both the math and reading scores, have increased in the percent of kids who, who are higher when they leave, release. And 62% is the highest we've had um, ever, I believe, since 1999 when we began collecting the data. Um, we also look at kids who receive treatment plans as prescribed in their individual plans, excuse me, receive treatment prescribed by their individual treatment plans. So mental health has been increasing, substance use dropped a little bit, and health increased. So again, the idea of our data is what we, we need to watch things, we need to know if things are going up or down, um, and we're always moving, hopefully, for improvement. We also look a lot at the relationships between staff and kids. And this shows you some of the results of what staff say and kids say. Um, when we talk about our survey responses, we're talking about 4,000 kids every April and October and 4,000 or, or more staff um, surveying. So you can see you can have a lot of fun with what kids say about staff making more positive comments than negative in, in what staff say. Um, there's some parallels and there's some opposites, but it helps anyone working in a facility or involved in an agency get a really nice picture of what's going on. And you know where to take it from there. And then we also ask kids about what is their perception of the family and facility relationship. So staff talk to the kids a lot about their family and how their friends can help them. Um, but their fam the family doesn't report talking to staff quite as much. So again, it's all important information. We look at connection to family and community in terms of kids reporting, if they've gotten visits from their families, as well as what families report. And we also look at the volunteer programs and programming in facilities as a way to see how community and facility connect and how kids and community um, when we talk about planning for the future, we ask families if they feel prepared for their child to come home. And most recently, 88% said yes, which was warming and nice to see. And then we've looked for a while since we started our work, um, including family serving family outcomes, on how families are involved with the discharge planning and. As you can see, not in, maybe three quarters reported that they were participants in the development of the discharge plan, um, and, and they understood and they agreed with the plan, and then they could comply with it. So I know facilities across the country are working on, on increasing the involvement of families, as well as how staff value families and partners in their work. And then I think I just have one more slide just to share you what we know at this moment. Um, talking about kids' preparedness for reentry, we look at aftercare plans that identify supportive teacher people. So that's an administrative piece of data. 
um, ask kids, do they have at least one person that know they can talk to at their home or in their community? And then asking families, are they prepared for their kids to come home? So good indicators and or flags for anyone trying to move this kind of work forward. Um, why are we doing this? All the reasons I've said, but I think it's um, so important just to get started. Um, we are not promising to be the be all and end all, but I hope you can see by sort of identifying, kind of starting from the very big picture of what are we trying to accomplish in terms of helping kids have a normal maturation process while they're taken away from their families and communities and, and incarcerated, um, and how we make sure that it happens and measure because positive youth development is such a, um, and the neuroscience is so rich and out there and so much of it I think ends up focusing on the way we need to keep kids in the community, we need to keep kids out of the deep end, which is certainly true and, and does disrupt their normal development terrifically, but we also need to make sure that we're working on it while kids are in custody and this is just one way to get that started. So I hope it's been helpful, um, and I'm going to now pass the baton over to Shannon. And this is a, a baton passing from Braintree, Massachusetts, all the way out to Oregon. So <laughs> we'll see how fast the technology is able to do it. Um, and if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box, and we will have time. Um, at the end for more questions. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Kim. And I just wanted to compliment the work of CJCA on really challenging the field to think beyond um, recidivism as an outcome, particularly forcing us to consider how the things that we do impact our outcomes and challenging that thinking is, is certainly courageous and I think you're you're providing a lot of leadership in that area, and Oregon's been super happy to participate in that effort with you, and we've learned a lot along the way. And hopefully my piece today is just to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned and um, how we have decided to approach this particular issue in our state. And I don't think it would surprise anyone on today's call to know that, or to kind of think about how if our primary outcome as an industry is the absence of a negative behavior, such as recidivism, um, that's not really success, and when we tend to measure things, that tends to be where we focus our efforts and energy and policy and practices and procedures, and so for our state, we really have been thinking about how do we meaningfully measure positive youth outcomes, but more specifically, how can we create a culture that supports us in getting there, and what you're seeing on your screen right now is um, should be a, a whole host of um, slides that I kind of was hoping that I could walk through just a few of them with you. I won't be delivering the whole training to you today, <laughs> so don't worry about that. But um, I wanted to kind of share with you, as soon as that comes up, a couple of the concepts that we have discovered as an agency. And that first major concept is that if we are measuring things um, and we decide that they are important for our agency, we need to have a culture to support that. And if our primary outcome at the time was recidivism, then we tended to notice that all of our policies, practices, procedures, and environments were centered around ensuring that kids didn't recidivate or come back to our care and custody. And in, we slowly started to discover that um, defining it in such a narrow way really was impacting the ways in which we felt we could interact with youth. We took a look at the research, and you saw in Kim's slides a couple of screenshots of um, Dr. Jeff Butt's work on positive youth justice. And that was a significant article for our agency and is it has heavily influenced our approach to positive human development. And you might be wondering why we've made the shift from positive youth development to positive human development. I'd like to share a little bit about why we did that. And so what I'm flipping through is a series of slides. This is an interesting slide on uh, communication breakdown. It's kind of a, an interesting icebreaker to illustrate how um, how quickly the messages that we make as leaders uh, erode and fall apart by the time they reach the folks that actually need to perform that work and are, are essentially carrying forth that mission. But I wanted to share with you today how we made that journey. And in 2012, our then director, Colette Peters, had attended a conference and she 
um, went to a session on culturally competent practices and positive youth development and became very inspired and asked a series of uh, uh, several folks in our agency, um, along with Fair Wars Paxresh, who is our current director at the time he was our deputy, to think about this concept from a juvenile justice setting. And that's really how we discovered Jeff Butts' work. Um, and what we do is we talk with our staff about what is this. It's grounded in decades of research. It requires that we work with young people that focuses on the fact that they're development, that they are going through a period of development. They're not just problems and deficits. And for many of you on this call, that's probably very intuitive and um, it makes a lot of sense to us. And when we think about our own children, we can make that connection. Um, but we really wanted to reinforce that point with our staff that we are here to help them develop successfully, not just make sure that they do not commit another crime once they leave us. We talk a lot about this concept about youth can be accountable and strengthened at the same time. And this is really one of those connection points between having a culture that supports the measurement of positive youth outcomes and having a culture that does not. If we don't fundamentally believe as a system that accountability comes in the form of skill development, comes in the form of achieving those positive youth outcomes, if we don't believe that as a system, there's no motivation to measure that. There's no motivation to track that. And if we're not measuring and tracking it, then there's certainly no motivation to develop and align our program and our treatment philosophies with that approach. We talk a lot about how it's not something that we do to youth, but something that we do with them. For example, um, we spend a lot of time talking about the day-to-day -day interactions and how those impact the brain. And I can mention the, the burgeoning neuroscience uh, that tells us about the, the adolescent brain and how it is developing and how that changes over time. And, for Oregon Youth Authority, we have about 700 youth in one of our facilities that we control their environment 24 hours a day. So we spend a lot of time talking about um, what I affectionately call nature's sick joke <laughs> with an emotional brain that doesn't necessarily have that reasoning and decision making quite online yet. And this is a real opportunity for our staff to kind of recast their role as an employee in our agency and as a member of our team, that they are in fact uh, responding to that youth who is developing and how do they structure their interactions to create those healthy brains and return those youth to their communities, not just as crime free, but productive and able to make great decisions, able to reason and able to exercise self-control. We show a lot of research around brain development, um, which I won't go through those slides in too much detail, but I do want to show you a really quick screenshot of our pyramid because I think this is one of the most important ways in which we've made progress in our measurement of positive youth outcomes. This is our general, um, essentially our, our, the picture of our agency's culture. And you will notice at the bottom of this that there is a medallion for staff and partners and there's a medallion for organizational structure, those gold circles. And they're at the bottom of this pyramid because that is foundational, um, as is safety and security. And in our agency, we expand safety and security to include not just the traditional sense of that as physical safety and security in a correctional environment, but we expand that to emotional and psychological safety and security. And we really get down to the nuts and bolts of what does that mean? What does it look like? And how does it feel? Those things are the foundation of our agency's culture. And um, that leads up to, as you can see, caring and supportive relationships, high expectations and accountability, meaningful participation and community connection. And there are positive outcomes that are connected to each of these levels. But we have this aha moment where we really made the jump from PYD to PhD and we realized that our staff will do their best work with youth and achieving those positive youth outcomes if they also experience a level of support at each one of these levels. And that has been a very huge, um, I think one of the most important contributors to our success so far in training our agency and getting them to shift the lens on what is it that you're looking for and how do we look for kids, how do we look for kids doing the right thing? How do we notice skill development? How do we recognize skill development? How do we support family connection? And these things are um, intuitive for much of our staff, and this is really providing them a framework to operate from and a shared language for our agency to speak from. And we're much more prepared to go to the legislature and talk about those positive outcomes because it's coming from a place of an agency identity, um, which is a, has been a pretty powerful message for us um, in our process moving forward. This training, um, we've learned a lot about implementation of culture change, and um, I would be happy to answer any questions related to that either on today's webinar or if you want to reach out after the fact. But um, we have learned that if we can provide that safe space for our team, our, our staff, to really engage with youth around those outcomes, that you're here not just to make sure these kids do not commit more crime, but you're in fact here to ensure that they become productive young adults 
that's a pretty inspiring message for, for the folks who are working for our agency. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Kim. And Kim, did you have anything specific you wanted me to speak to? Well, many things, but I think there's a question that came in, a couple of questions that came in from some of um, the people on the call that will get you to answer. And um, or maybe, why don't I answer this first one from what I know, and, and then I think you could probably add a lot to it. Um, Brennan, do you want to read us the question that came in? Sure. question yeah. we came in, I think it's a good one. It came in from Fred who wants to know, are race and cultural differences taken into account when we look at tracking and measuring positive youth outcomes. How does that get factored in when we look at this? So I will tell them, Shannon, what I know about um, how we do it and then um, turn it back to you to talk how that works at, at OYA. Um, it, it, that's just such a hard thing and, and I just was um, learning about it most recent study and all the positive youth development efforts you know, to keep kids out are not necessarily benefiting the minority of the black kids, but it's in fact really um, in some places helping white kids more. So when kids are in the facilities, um, what we do, Fred, is we um, have created with this great project um, funded by the John D. MacArthur, uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and the Washington Juvenile uh, Rehabilitation Administration, um, a way we um, disaggregated uh, what we call our youth record report, which is just basically everything you would look at in a kid's record. But J in Washington, specifically, they wanted to know what they could do at the facilities that would help the black kids from recidivating at a higher rate. So they went and they looked at things like who was doing better in reading and math, and they looked at who was getting substance use services in the facility, who needed that when they got the community and who actually was connected to a community provider and got the services. And they found a couple of um, interesting um, different things that they could do. One did have to do with connecting minority kids, connecting all kids, but in particular the minority kids who weren't getting as connected to some of the community-based services um, from the things that their screening and assessments had told them that they need to work on. And I think another thing that comes up um, when places look at this kind of data is making sure that it is not the minority kids who, for example, who are in isolation so they miss time in school. So those were sort of the two things that came up. Um, and I think from PBS's point of view, it's, it's this uh, more digging deeper, another layer looking at the data. So not only what programs and services are provided to all kids, but what is the impact on the different races and ethnicities. So that's just how we do it from the population that is um, within these facility walls. I think I've, I know there are other um, agencies that are also trying to look at their release by race and ethnicity, but for us it's really just about the services and are they provided to all children. Shannon, is there some way you all are um, addressing it either through your training or other work? We, we are certainly um, heavily invested in what we call equity and outcomes, and that's, it kind of has two components. It's ensuring that all that youth, regardless of their demographic characteristics, are achieving the outcomes that we hope for them at um, a level of equality. But I think part of our training is really focused on empowering our staff to identify how to connect those youth to their communities of choice and helping them to identify what pro-social ties and what level of engagement they can have in those communities. And social learning today will tell us that if you maintain ties to a pro-social community, then you're a lot less likely to sort of um, try, do things that might get you kicked out of that community, so to speak. And so I think it's, it is a very worthwhile and necessary conversation. And then also I would offer that as agencies think about positive youth outcomes with respect to youth from various demographic categories is to recognize that what might be positive for one group isn't necessarily the standard for all groups. And we, just as we become individualized in our treatment approaches, we also need to become individualized in our understanding of, of what's going to help them maintain success. That's awesome. Well, I've, I've got another question that's uh, looking at uh, the positive youth outcome measures uh, from another perspective. So that's race and 
ethnicity and cultural barriers, how are we factoring that in? What about um, age differences for uh, younger kids versus older kids? How does uh, how do the expectations change? Are there different expectations for younger versus older uh, youth? And uh, Shannon, is there anything that uh, you think you could add on that? There was some pretty um, great research that's come out recently in the Pathways to Desistance study that talks, I think, if I'm understanding your question, Brendan, that talks about, um, you know, what are the intervention strategies for youth who are slightly younger versus slightly older? And at what point is family connection really going to be the biggest bang for our buck? versus job skills and education. And so I think our, the research is going to continue to grow in that area where we really can understand that this is not a one-size-fits-all approach, which I think is one of the reasons why OYA has elected to focus very heavily on its culture component to support the measurement and individualization of our approach with the young people that we work with. But I would say absolutely the strategies are going to vary um, for younger kids versus older kids. and. Um, absolutely finding create ways to creatively think outside of the box and recognizing the value of evidence-based practices, but evidence-based for whom, and can we start to ensure that we have an array of services available for people of, that that may not fall into the categories that were based that the research was based upon. And Shannon, you have kids up to how old? We have youth up to age 25, it, or you yeah. sorry, so you really deal birthday. with. Yeah, you deal with the yeah. full spectrum, as you in California, so. Yeah, and, and Shannon, um, you may want to talk about the online college courses that the older kids are are engaged in, and some of them have been very, very successful, and one was just featured in, in Rural Light uh, magazine. We we have a we're very fortunate in Oregon to have some very energetic folks who are focused on education administration for youth who are in close custody and that that's our term for secure facility and we have college teachers coming in to teach those courses we have access to online education we have access to something called CLEP testing which is uh, sort of a self study type of education where they can take a test and if they pass the test they earn college credit. So it's really getting access to those higher education opportunities for, for these young men um, so that they're making some progress and, um, and able to achieve some educational and vocational goals while they're with us. One of the things, I've spent a lot of time with those, those gentlemen who are, um, who are taking those classes and you know, they, they express frustration at times you know, because they're, they're not getting that real college experience, but I keep, we just try to keep reminding them that, hey, like, you're, you're advancing yourself, you're getting these skills, and eventually you're going to be able to take that somewhere. And keeping that motivation up and getting access to it, it it's been a real strength for, for those guys. Well, Shannon, I'm, I've got a few more questions that I think are directed towards you, so it looks like you're on the hot seat right now. Okay. Let me ask you a little uh -oh. bit about, um, <laughs> so we always get questions about buy-in and staff buy-in. So when, as you guys are administering this training, are there certain things uh, that you're doing to get staff buy-in? And then um, I, I had another kind of similar question is, uh, was there any kind of method used to ensure that staff benefited from that pyramid that you showed us earlier? And what's the process transparent? Wow, these are awesome questions. So I'm totally excited to answer <laughs> both of them. I'll take the first one, which is the staff buy-in question. And that's phenomenal. Um, we spent a good year and a half developing this curriculum. And one of our priorities was that if we were going to put this pretty pyramid out there and say, hey, this is our agency's culture, we had to deliver the training practicing that culture. So the very first thing that we do with our training is um, what we call the Mythbusters exercise. And that's, um, tell us what you've heard. Tell us what you've heard about PhD, PYD. Let's just put it out there. And create a very comfortable and safe space for folks to say, well, um, I heard that it means that we don't hold youth accountable anymore. Or I heard that it's the hug a thug approach. I heard that it's, you know, um, a great way of dealing with young people. And we just put good, bad, negative, positive, we put it all out there. And we let them know that, you know, over the next day and a half that we spend with you, we're going to keep adding to that list, and hopefully by the end of this, we'll be able to have a clear idea of what it is that we're talking about. When when they're able to kind of put it all out on the table, we find that the buy-in is kind of already there. Like I'm interested. So what is this really about? Is it are are the myths correct, or you know, tell me the real story? We we have been um, training this in very small groups of 20 to 30 folks, and 
reminding them, letting them know that this is a conversation. This is We're starting an agency conversation about how we show up to do our jobs every day. How are we feeling about the work that we do and what do we need to do differently to ensure that we're achieving youth success and we're feeling pretty great about our work at the same time. Those strategies are, are working. I think we anticipated a, a lot more resistance than we're actually getting. In fact, folks are saying that, that this has been pretty powerful training for them, not only in their work lives, but in their personal lives. So I think that those are the kinds of things that I think about with buy-in is like, we're not coming in and training saying, you've been doing it wrong all these years, do it this way. We're saying, you've been doing some great things, let's provide a framework for us to all operate from so that we're being strategic and intentional about it. So hopefully that addresses the first question. And um, Brendan, do you mind saying the second one for me again? So, I mean, in terms of the pyramid, were there any uh, particular methods that were followed to deliver that and, and how transparent was the process? So we had a series of work groups that had over 100 staff um, participate in some way, shape, or form, as well as several of our youth to develop that concept. And in the training, we talk very, very directly about how this is not, I mean, Maslow, <laughs> Abraham Maslow in the hierarchy of needs, he had it right. And he was pretty interested as a humanistic psychologist in what made people successful. And that's what we're interested in as an agency. So let's take these concepts and, and I'll look at them through a juvenile justice lens. And again, pulling heavily from Jeff Butts' work around the victim, villain, and resource lens. Do we view youth through those lenses? Do we view ourselves through those lenses? Do we view our boss through those lenses? And if so, what's working and, and what's maybe not working so well? Um, we've been we have tried to be incredibly transparent in the development of this model, letting folks know how it is that we came to this place because, our, uh, again, that bottom level of our pyramid is safety and security, and that includes emotional and psychological safety and security, and transparency is a big piece of that for me. I need to know, as a, as a team member of OIA, I need to know that, you know, this is the supported direction of my agency and that if, I, if I'm thinking about doing something differently, I'm going to be supported by my colleagues in doing that. Um, so transparency has been a big piece of it, and we welcome pushback. We welcome critical conversation. Um, a big component of our training is working through scenarios that are really tricky in real life situations that have happened in our agency and in our facilities to understand how we did it and how could we have done it differently. And just um, those, I think those activities are really helping folks to feel like this is not just the flavor of the month initiative, that there was actually a considerable thought and research put into that. Great. Well, thank you. I think you've addressed both those questions. Uh, so I've got a question on, I think, some of the data and the outcomes that we were showing earlier, and that's that the, the time that youth spend in corrections varies greatly, and are there any criteria that goes into determining the sampling strategy when it comes to the PBS reports? And uh, I'd actually be glad to help with that as a staff member here at PBS. Uh, it depends on the piece of data that we're collecting, but generally when we talk about youth records and those case files that we're collecting from youth who are released, PBS will collect those every six months, and they're for youth who are released from the facility, and we give sites a random number generator so that they can select a 30 random youth records so that what you're going to have when you look at your outcome measures is a scope of, of anyone from who might have been there for a short, short amount of time uh, it might have been released or transferred to another facility, and you could see what kinds of services they had during their stay, but it would also have those that might have been there the entire time and went all the way through uh, from intake through aftercare and covers their entire stay, but it's always a random sample. And the same goes for youth and staff climate surveys. When we look at those perceptions of youth and staff, is that we ask that the uh, number of staff that receive the surveys, the number of youth that get those surveys are randomly selected so that you have a good mix of those that have been there uh, maybe for a week or a month and those that might have been there for six months or, or possibly longer depending on the program type that they're staying at. Uh, and then the, the one other survey that varies a little bit for corrections is an exit interview because that's done only for those that are uh, being released from the program to either a lesser secure or to, uh, to home ideally. Uh, but that is done uh, for all youth released from the program so you get the entire sample every youth who gets released from the facility there uh, falling into that range. So when we look at those outcome measures and all that aggregated data that Kim showed earlier, we're looking at that entire spectrum, not just um, those that are completing programs or uh, those that are in a specific area, but everybody that we're seeing in corrections. So hopefully that helps answer that question. 
hopefully I gave Shannon a little bit of a break from uh, the questions that we've got here. Um, but Shannon, I've, I've got another one that I'll direct your way, and I think this one is, uh, so it's what mentoring, uh, mentorship projects do you have that involve community members, volunteers, or other community companies that could help support what you're doing? You, you said mentorship programs, is that what I heard? It says mentoring ship, but I believe it's mentorship. Okay, yeah, great. Um, well, and again, this is a very research savvy audience that we have today because I think we, we're all kind of <laughs> intuitively aware of the things that work with young people. And we have a very robust volunteer program and we, we not only use mem mentors from the community, but we're working on how to empower youth who are in our facilities and who are doing well to mentor other youth who are not doing well. Um, and I, this won't surprise anyone, but that's, um, we have youth who are just very excited about that opportunity and find that it's a source of personal growth for them just as much as it is for the youth that they are working with who happens to be struggling. We also have a program that um, we refer to as Hope Partnership, which is a collaboration with one of our community residential providers, Janice Youth Programs, which brings in all different kinds of folks from the community, um, Toastmasters, for example, and um, lots of other types of skill-based groups from the community to come in and work with our youth, either in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, uh, to get exposure and connection to that community. So the fifth level, excuse me, the fifth level of our pyramid is community connection. And for youth who are in a facility for months, if not years, it's difficult to maintain that connection to community. So we have to think outside of the box about how do we bring opportunities to connect to those youth and ensure that those, those opportunities are meaningful and that they're helping the youth grow and develop those skills. So um, we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about that as a component and it's certainly not where we would like for it to be. That is probably one of the most challenging areas uh, to work in is how do, you, how do you sustain those types of programs, but we have had some success in that area for certain. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Brendan, we're scrolling around. It doesn't look like there are any more questions. We'll give you another second or two. But um, Shannon, thank you so much. Shannon not only is um, a wealth of information, but she's a joy to work with and um, also was available on very short notice, <laughs> which we really appreciate because as you can tell, in Oregon, they are really putting this into place and they're doing it strategically, intentionally, and measurably. Um, so it's a, a great model, and we learn so much just from every time we hear what is going on across the country. Um, I thank everybody here. We have some PBS staff in the room, Ned, Brendan, Lisa, and Patricia are here, so thank all you guys for this webinar. Ned, thank you for CJCA inviting us to talk about what we do, and helping move this positive youth development movement forward. Well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Brendan, and thank you, Shannon, for uh, putting on, I think, um, where we're going in the future. These are the kind of webinars, I think, that people are really hungry for uh, to find out how we can shift away from just measuring where kids fail but measuring where kids succeed. So thanks again to everybody, and thank you, all of you, for um, joining in today. Stay Check in with the uh, CJCA or PBS websites for future webinars. There will be a few more webinars coming up. There's going to be one on, on trauma-informed care that our, our uh, mental health work group is going to be putting on. Uh, there will be two or three uh, webinars on trauma-informed care. So uh, check, check in on the website from, period, from time to time for those announcements. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.